Blech. <laughs> Studio 666. So during the pandemic, Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters decided to shoot a horror movie in secret. There was no buzz about this thing. They just, boom, dropped it, laid it out on the table like it was their big, thick dick. Initially, I wasn't really sure what to make of it. Is it like a narrative story? What is this, like a docu-feature? I love that the Foo Fighters made their own movie. They are one of those bands that has literally conquered every facet of artistic exploration. They've played all over the world. They've released platinum records. Dave comes from Nirvana and has collaborated with members of Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, Queens of the Stone Age. He did a documentary about a famous mixing console, Sound City, check that out. He did tracks with Lee Ving from Fear. There's so many different tracks on that thing where he did those collaborations, it's wonderful. He pseudo reunited Nirvana with the other guys and Paul McCartney and then did it with Joan Jett. I mean, they weren't actually Nirvana, but like surviving members of Nirvana with Paul McCartney, Paul Vana, that's what I call them. There's like a handful of Foo Fighter songs that I really, really love. But overall, musically, sonically, I could kind of take them or leave them. I've never really given their discography a full, honest listen. So perhaps there's more songs that I would appreciate and that I just haven't listened to yet. I do love me some Nirvana, though. And the Germs are great. Pat Schmier from the Germs and Nirvana. So I mean, like, why not make a movie? And why not make a horror movie? The story idea comes from Dave Grohl himself, who does much of the heavy lifting on screen, playing a fictionalized version of Dave Grohl, of course. And he brought in Tony Gardner, one of my favorite horror special effects gurus working today. And he said, hey, Tony, figure out a bunch of really crazy ways that you would want to dispatch people in a movie. Dave took his story and the list of simulated deaths and brought it to some screenwriters and they turned it into a screenplay. And then they took that screenplay and they gave it to a director by the name of B.J. McDonnell and they made Studio 666. The mansion that the movie takes place in is actually where the Foo Fighters recorded their 10th studio album. And so the movie kind of manifested itself out of joking, sarcastic discussions about, hey, what if this place was actually haunted? Because they legitimately felt all sorts of creepy vibes. The story is pretty straightforward and derivative, but that's not what makes it shine. Basically, the Foo Fighters go to this mansion to record their 10th album. Their manager is played by Jeff Garland. He's a guy named Tony Schill. It's great. And they go to this mansion. They feel the weird vibes. Carrie King from Slayer is one of their roadies setting up gear. And Dave Grohl stumbles upon recordings made by a band that was there in 1993. This band that was practicing some bad juju magic falls apart when the leader dispatches everybody. This is the 1993 band, including my favorite favorite actress working in genre films today, Jenna Ortega. Ugh, Jenna Ortega, my new forever love. Nev Campbell, you'll always be my forever love. Jenna Ortega, you are right next to her as my other forever love. I talked about in a previous review how I think Taylor Russell as Zoe is a really great Sydney final girl. I really want to see Jenna Ortega alongside him, the three of them working together. I'm so glad that she survived in the new Scream movie and that she will be back for Scream 6. I hope that they shift the focus to her. They don't shift the focus to her in this movie, though, because she is dispatched in the first five minutes. And I was like, ah, oh, I'm so tired of Jenna Ortega getting murdered in every other movie besides Scream. Let her live, man! Because Tony Gardner is involved, the kills are super gruesome. Everything is practical effects. Sorry, I'm not describing the plot very well. In any case, the band with Jenna Ortega, they left their tapes in the basement. Dave hears them. And of course, Dave, much like some twist of Exorcist meets Evil Dead, he becomes possessed. He was having writer's block before, and now he's got all these song ideas, but really it's just the evil forces wanting Dave to finish writing this particular song because it will open up a doorway or something to evil forces. You know the drill. Dave invents new musical notes, like L, because, you know, it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G or something. I don't know. I'm not a musician. But he's like, yeah, we're playing it in L sharp. The script is really, really funny. And 
and the guys, the Foo Fighters are really funny. As I mentioned, Dave does most of the heavy lifting in all of the acting scenes. All the other Foo Fighters kind of, you know, they do what they can. Taylor Hawkins, R.I.P., refused to memorize dialogue. And so every line that he says in the movie is actually improvised. But Dave is a really good actor and he does have practice because he played the devil in the Tenacious D movie, The Pick of Destiny. Great uncredited cameo because David also played drums for Tenacious D on that album. So in any case, the Foo Fighters start to get knocked off one by one. Their neighbor tries to warn them, played by Whitney Cummings, comedian. She's hilarious. And there's a delivery boy who has his own band called Bone Structure. Hilarious name for a band. Played by the brilliant Will Forte. And he keeps coming back. He doesn't have Dave's ranch. He has to keep coming back with the ranch. There are all these like running gags. It is the perfect amount of comedy and horror mixed together. That was my Chris Farley in the Pepper Boy sketch from SNL impression. And if you've never seen that sketch, go check it out on YouTube right now. It's the perfect amount of comedy with horror. As Dave is dispatched Batching his bandmates, he's eating them. There's like ribs, and you can just see Dave is chewing on a spare rib, but it's it's just it's great, man. You could tell they're like little inside jokes used, like who's manning the grill tonight. Like you could tell the Foo Fighters are always grilling whenever they're together, or like you know, recording albums. It just seems like part of their, you know, panache. I don't know. So they're completing this album. And the song, by the way, is also hilariously long. Initially, the song doesn't have an ending, it's just a forever going song. And as the movie continues, the song song gets longer and longer. I think by the end, it's like a 44 minute song. And who's engineering the session? None other than John Carpenter himself. So great to see John Carpenter just randomly show up as a studio engineer. You also get a little bit of that feeling that like maybe that they're supposed to be like the funky monks, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers recording Blood Sugar Sex Magic in the mansion via Rick Rubin. Little vibe of that too. But perhaps the most glaring question that kept running through my mind while I was watching Studio 666 what motivated Dave Grohl to make this movie, considering his history? One can't help but imagine that this is maybe supposed to be some sort of parallel for Nirvana in just the slightest. Considering Dave Grohl's past history and future history, it's a weird movie for the Foo Fighters to make. That's not to say that if something really bad happens to you in the past that you can't enjoy horror movies. I just imagine that dispatching your band members when, you know, your lead singer did what he did in Nirvana, you know what happened to Kurt Cobain. It feels like maybe working through some trauma. Who knows? Like, you know, subconsciously working through some trauma. Dave dispatching all of his bandmates as he's possessed by a demon. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't know Dave, and I don't know what, I haven't seen any interviews that Dave is done regarding this movie, but I would imagine that maybe like, you know, it's compartmentalized. Point being, I saw this movie built on top of real life history that sort of thematically is similar in some way, shape, or form. And of course, shortly after this movie came out, Taylor Hawkins, who Dave kills in the movie, also tragically passed away while they were on tour. I truly wonder what he must think of this movie right now. I doubt the Foo Fighters will make a another movie after this one. The movie ends with all of Dave's band members dispatched, and now Dave is a solo act and possessed by the demon spirit still. So in a weird kind of way, the demons that are possessing Dave are, they're a metaphor for ego and the rock star attitude, the fame and success that go to a musician's head. When one band member rises above all the other ones, in name recognition, prolificness in writing. So even though the plot is really simple, it does have some depth to it on certain levels. One thing that I really wanted to see, I was really glad when Jenna Ortega came back at the end, by the way. One thing I really wanted to see and what I was expecting, it would have been the cherry twist on top of the Sunday. I was expecting Tenacious D to show up. I would have loved to have seen JB and KG take on Dave Grohl as the devil. I mean, it would have been perfect. They could have been the exorcist exercising the demons out of Dave. It would have worked great. And then the three of them could have formed a new band. The end. I think Studio 666 is definitely destined for cult status among all the other music-related midnight movies that are out there. 